What is going on guys? A couple of you have been asking me the question about input and output buffering and you've seen me implement this essentially input and output map in my programs that I've done previously on this channel and you've probably encountered this practice in the online programs that you've seen as well as probably some of the stuff that you've seen at work if you're programming PLCs and in this video we're going to be discussing why we do, um, we do want to buffer our inputs and outputs as well as some of the key advantages that I've personally had to use and seen in uh, the practical experience and we're also going to look at the PLC in order to fully understand this concept. Before we get started with today's video we just wanted to quickly point out all the great content we've been releasing on the Solus PLC YouTube channel and this includes industrial automation PLC programming as well as HMI development and if you enjoy this type of content we would really appreciate it if you could click the subscribe button as well as the notification bell in order to receive the latest and greatest content we will be posting to the channel channel. So in order to understand the software, we're going to briefly look at the hardware. And in front of you, I have the same PLC that I've been programming on this channel for quite a few times. So the Compact Logix L24 ER QB1 B processor. And this is a processor which features onboard inputs and outputs. As you can see here, the DC in is labeled by this essentially blue pane and there's 16 of them and the green ones are going to be the DC outputs. So the output, the PLC has a lot of different points on the front plate. And as you can see here, I also have this DC input card, which has 16 inputs. And it's very common to see this PLC paired with multiple cards. Also, what I have on the table is a point IO rack. So very small point IO rack, which also has 24 volt sync inputs, as well as 24 volt VDC source outputs. Now, as you probably already know, each one of these inputs and outputs can only have a single wire landed on them. And the reason for that, of course, is the physical constraint. So what you want to first of all take advantage of is that whenever any one of these fails and it will fail at one point or another you want to be able to physically move your wire for example from this output to the next output which is not being used and chances are in the field whenever you design a system you're not going to be using all all the outputs and the inputs that you've specified for in order for that purpose for that exact purpose of them failing and you being able to replace. The same thing happens here. So you have cards which accommodate inputs and outputs on, on the point IO. And as they fail, you can simply move the wires from one point to another. Now let's turn our head to the software. And now looking at the software, you can see that I have local inputs. So these are the ones that came from the chassis right here, the local inputs labeled in blue. And they are, there's going to be 16 of them. Now, in our code, as you can see, I bring in all of the inputs and then I give them a local tag, which is going to be within this array in loc. So in loc one, and then each one of them is going to be numbered according to the same position that is given to them by the hardware. So it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth. Now imagine that the, this, for example, so let's start it off with what you shouldn't do. So for example, if you have this input coming in, local one input data zero, you can of course use this exact same bit in your program. So let's go into just a general routine and this is getting the clock time, but let's say you have a rung which starts off by using this bit and then it energizes some kind of a different bit. And then you have more logic, which, you know, for example, we're using we're using the first input. So let's say both of these need to be true in order to, for some bit to activate, then you go down below and then you use this bit as an XIO instruction. And then this activates some kind of a different bit or any other timer logic whatsoever. And this specific input fails. So the hardware fails, you know, whatever uh, the transistor or the resistor inside of the PLC has failed. Now, in order to fix that, you as the PLC engineer slash technician, we need to go back here, right click this local one input data zero, go to cross reference, and then start replacing these one by one, you'll have to go back into your logic and essentially relocate them from a zero and change them to another input which has been used. Now, if you, um, instead of using this tag, if you use this one, so let's 
take a look at that. Let's go into general and let's replace the zero with this tag that we've specified, not with the OTE, but just the tag. And here we'll select it and put this in. So let's say you're using the tag which has been buffered. You go back to your inputs and this output fails, all you need to do is edit this rung and then change this to whatever input you've moved that wire to. So for example, if you move it to 14, you put this 14 in, you compile the program and now this input 14 will automatically take care of all the other all the other tags which are residing within this bit. So very, very simple. You don't need to go back and change and tr trace the logic. The other benefit of essentially buffering your tags is the advantage of labeling. So what do you typically do when you start off a machine? You do have to go through each and every input and output and test them. So this gives you the opportunity to go into your logic, which you've written just like it is written here and start putting in some comments. So for example, this input local one, you could control, you could right click this and then edit the description and you'll say something like, local input or one green push button push button on so you give this a certain description and you can go down the row and essentially implement this as well so green so this is going to be some kind of a yellow push button on and this is for example let's say local input one motor one running and this is actually input three, input two, and you give every single input and output a description. And then when the system fails, you have a single place which you can see what's really going on with your inputs and why uh, something, for example, is not showing up. So here you can look at uh, whether or not the green push button is being pressed. Instead of going into your general instruction and you might have different logic which goes you know in many different directions so it's not always very clear from you know just utilizing that tag without having an input map now the next next very important advantage you'll notice that in my program besides just the inputs i have this input loop and this input loop i've created it because um i need a very specific a very specific implementation on my inputs which is called um debouncing and debouncing what that really does is it makes sure it makes sure that something has been pressed or been activated for a certain amount of time so let me give you an example you have a bunch of photo eyes and the photo eyes are looking for the presence of a certain uh, product for example so a box now a box will typically block a photo eye for a certain duration now if you were to just use the tag directly and use it in your logic you would need to create a timer which would say is if the if the photo eye has been up or has been high for a certain amount of time then you want to trigger that specific bit so let's just uh look at the way uh at the way that's going to work so i'm going to create a new rung here and we're going to use the example of this input zero so if this input zero has been on for a certain amount of time i'm going to add a timer so t on and this is going to be a local debounce timer. And once the timer is done, I'm not going to build a full logic. I'm going to activate this. So local debounce timer is done. I'm going to activate a certain bit. So timer dot done. So this is going to be new local timer. This is going to be type timer in the main program create. And this is going to activate a certain debounced bit. So for example, this is local input one. So I'm going to be calling that local in debounced one. And I'm going to create a new one. It's a Boolean, hit create. And let's say here, let's say for one single second, the tag, the input needs to be enabled in order for this debounce to be on. Now, as you can probably expect doing this uh the scheme becomes very very tedious as you start getting more and more inputs and more and more outputs of course on the outputs you want to extend the time so long story short i want you to understand that it's very easy to do this in the same place instead of reapplying this logic all over your code within the main routine so just like i explained this timing to you 
what I do here is once the inputs are all read, I use a for loop to set the debounce timer for each one of those inputs. And as you can see, it, it loops from input zero all the way to 15 for a total of 16 inputs, which once again are on the PLC side. And that way I can set the debounce as well as the, the on and the off bits through the input loop so hopefully that clarifies why you would want to buffer your inputs as well as your outputs i do have the same routine on my outputs here as well and just like the inputs it makes it really easy to troubleshoot to see what's going on in the system as you can see here i have a little bit more logic on the outputs so that i could force them through the hmi essentially and that's another reason why you want to concentrate all of your inputs and outputs in the same routines and just make it really easy and simple for you to troubleshoot but also for you to program and uh, essentially deploy the system once it is in the field. Thank you guys so much for watching my content. If you have any questions on this topic, make sure to leave them in the comment section below. And if you can spend five seconds of your time liking as well as sharing that video, if you've enjoyed it, that would mean absolutely the world to me. And if you have any suggestions for the channel, what kind of hardware software I should be covering, then make sure to leave that down there as well. See you next time. Take care. Bye.